and I would like to reserve four minutes for rebuttal. Four minutes. You're being independent and creative instead of three. All right. I do attempt. May it please the court. My name is Paul Krogh, and I'm here from Nashville, like Judge Clement, oh, well. on behalf of Welcome. the defendant and appellant in this case, Mr. William Getz. In 2019, this court, writing through Judge Stafford in Parker versus Brunswick Forest Homeowners Association, held that a fee-shifting clause only authorizes an award of fees in a case when it explicitly conveys a right to them under the applicable facts. Here, unlike in Parker, the trial court awarded fees when the relevant clause, one in the subdivision declaration, did not explicitly convey a right to them under the facts. For that reason, the judgment of fees below must be reversed. And I'd like to focus on that issue today, and it flows, the conclusion flows from two simple premises. First, the trial court entered a judgment on the party's settlement agreement, not on the underlying declaration itself. And second, the fee-shifting clause in the declaration only extends to enforcing its obligations. And that's the, that's the quote, enforcing any obligation. And it doesn't cover, therefore, the judgment under the party's settlement agreement. Now, the trial court's order, which appears on page, starting at page 510 of the record, shows a clear intent to dispose of the case via the settlement agreement, which the parties entered into, I think, back in 2018. And if we read the order, which we do, and we read it like any other instrument, right? And Judge Stafford, again, in 2015, in the Young case, told us that, relying on Convolink and Stidham versus Fickles Ayers, Supreme Court precedents. The clear import of the order is that the case is controlled and is being disposed of under that settlement agreement. Page 512 of the record, page three of the court's order, it says it twice, that the parties should be bound by the settlement agreement and that it's the settlement agreement that defines the issues in the case. And then on the next page, page four of the order, the court devotes most of that page to explicitly laying out why it's employing the settlement agreement and why Mr. Goetz breached the settlement agreement and says that it's undisputed that Mr. Goetz is in breach of the settlement agreement and that the question in the case is breach of the settlement agreement. And so in terms of what the court- Mr. Mr. Clark, what about the last page of the order? Doesn't it also say that your client breached the Declaration of Covenants? Well, Your Honor, it says that he breached something and I was, and that's my friend Mr. Baskin has pointed to that in his brief and uh, you know, I was respectfully submit that that's a classic example of um, an ambiguous statement, right? It says whether it is the declaration or the settlement agreement, he is in breach. Well, that doesn't say which. And if we look at the main body of the document, we find all the focus on the settlement agreement. And how, how do we read instruments? This is something the court does every day all the time. We read them as a whole and read them in a way that makes them intelligible and sustainable. And so you don't take an ambiguous statement and use it to disregard clear, plain, interrelated statements that reflect a coherent thought. You do the exact opposite. If you've got a clear statement, multiple clear statements that show what the author of the instrument is trying to do, and then you've got an ambiguous or a contrary statement somewhere else, you throw out the ambiguous one and take the clear ones. And we've cited, I think, five or six Tennessee Supreme Court cases in our brief where the court applied those principles to a number of kinds of instruments and did exactly that. And we also read, and of course this is a summary judgment ruling, and so we read it with Smith versus UHS of Lakeside and Rule 56.04 in the back of our minds. And what is the analysis and the reasoning that's laid out in 
the order. What is it that the court has said that would make its ruling sustainable, and we want to try to sustain the order? What's the analysis that makes it sustainable under Smith? And the only reasoned analysis is this extensive discussion about breach of the settlement agreement. And so I, don't, I think the order fails Smith if you read it as finding breach of the declaration. Now, the summary judgment itself, uh, Mr. Crawl, what, what was the basis for the summary judgment? Was it a breach of the settlement agreement or a breach of the covenants? Are you asking about the, to interpret the court's order or the motion filed by the plaintiff? Yeah, the motion for summary judgment. What was the claim in the motion? Was the claim that your client breached the settlement agreement or that he breached the declaration of covenants? I believe that the claim that the plaintiff made in the motion was sort of a both and, Your Honor. I mean, certainly the plaintiff has, has argued and continues to argue that the record showed, not only showed breach of the covenants, a technical breach, but that it was entitled to judgment under, under the covenants, under the declaration. It, but what the trial court didn't do is the trial court didn't dispose of the question under the declaration, right? It, and the trial court refers to in this order the fact that it had previously found disputed questions of material fact about arbitrariness and capriciousness. I mean, there had been an initial motion for summary judgment um, that wasn't granted. And the trial court doesn't dispose in its order of those arbitrariness and capriciousness issues, right? There's no discussion of the factors from Hughes or Indian Hills. What we have is we've got a very simple uh, analysis, a very straightforward analysis about breach of this very simple, very straightforward settlement agreement. And we haven't challenged the courts, uh, the trial court's conclusion that Mr. Getz breached the settlement agreement. And so with that in mind, it, did the declaration allow for fee shifting under this judgment, the one that enforced the settlement agreement? And the answer is no, because the declaration only allows recovery of costs and expenses of enforcing any obligation under the declaration itself. And the declaration obviously does not impose an obligation to comply with the settlement agreement or to comply substantively with the settlement agreement's terms, which was following the recommendation of this architect, Mr. Bologna. And a fee-shifting clause that requires one kind of judgment, right, doesn't authorize fees when you get a different kind of judgment, even when the prevailing party gets the same tangible outcome. Right, and the court, this court addressed that issue last year in the At Last Inc. versus Buckley, where we had a fee-shifting clause that referred to breach and that was the, the quote, you know, if the party breaches the agreement, then there would be fees. And there wasn't a final judgment of breach. There was a preliminary finding of breach. They got a preliminary injunction. that Somebody had likely breached an agreement. And the plaintiff obtained the tangible relief it wanted via that preliminary injunction. And then it took a non-suit. And there was no, never a final judgment of breach. And this court said, you didn't prevail on a claim of breach. And so that's not in the final judgment. And so you don't get your fees. Well, here, we don't have a final judgment that enforces the declaration. It doesn't say breach of the declaration, enforce the declaration. It enforces the settlement agreement. Now, the tangible result sort of in the real world might wind up being the same. But just like at last, that's not what the law is. Right? The law is that you have to have those precise correspondence between the facts and the judgment and the terms. And enforce is narrower, enforce is narrower. And the plaintiff hasn't really put forward an argument that is indistinguishable really from the argument it would make if this were a prevailing party or a related to uh, type of fee shifting agreement, fee shifting clause. And, and you see those sometimes, right? Any lawsuit related to these covenants, the prevailing party shall obtain fees. And you know, we've cited several cases in the brief, the New Covenant Baptist Church and the Darva Marnish case, I'm probably mispronouncing that, where the court has found um, cases where the party might have won, 
but didn't, quote, enforce the thing it had to enforce. And because the judgment didn't enforce the declaration per se, the fee shifting clause shouldn't apply. Um, the Ohio Court of Appeals reached a result that's really on all fours in a case called Somerset Sinfuel, Sinfuel, S-Y-N-F-U-E-L, uh, number one LLC versus Resource Recovery International, 935 Northeast 2nd, 497 from 2005, where they found that a settlement agreement, you know, if you prevail on a settlement agreement, you aren't enforcing the underlying contract. And here we have the same thing. Plaintiff succeeded in enforcing a settlement agreement. It did not succeed in enforcing the declarations. There would be, there remained disputed questions of fact, which the trial court properly predominated um, because it didn't have to get there. And for those reasons, Your Honors, we submit that the judgment of attorney's fees should be, must be reversed. All right, thank you, thank Mr. You. Crowe. We'll hear from you further on rebuttal. Morning, Your Honors. Uh, my name is Peter Baskind. Uh, I'm from the Memphis Bar and I'm representing the Homeowners Association in this case. Here's the good news. There's a lot that Mr. Getz and I can agree on. The association has the right to enforce its declaration. Uh, Mr. Getz changed the color of his home in violation of the rules under the declaration. In fact, Mr. Getz even admits in his answer and in the um, uh, briefing uh, prior to summary judgment that he is in breach of the declaration. In fact, you can look at paragraph 13 of his answer. Um, we also agree that this court should construe the judgment in its entirety. Oh, and by the way, let me answer a question that uh, Judge Armstrong brought up. Our motion for summary judgment was brought solely under the declaration. In fact, it would have to be, uh, Your Honor, because we didn't uh, pray anything in the complaint about the settlement agreement. So the motion for summary judgment is solely under the declaration. Now, well, let me ask you, when you got the judge's order, were you concerned about her focus on simply the settlement agreement? Um, because there are places throughout that order. Look, that's all she talks about. She does. and. Uh, I was before this court once and we were talking about a, uh, about a contract that the court said was not the model of clarity, and perhaps you can say that about this order, but if you will look at my motion for summary judgment, the actual motion, it's on page 290 of, of the record, I am discussing the settlement agreement for the purpose of demonstrating that the association was acting reasonably. Why were they acting reasonably? Because we're asking Mr. Getz to do something he had already agreed to do. Of course, he failed to do it, uh, which is why we had to file suit. But it, it, am I a little troubled by the, by the language? Not especially, but I understand why the court might ask that question. But let, let's talk about the actual plain language of the order because that's what it comes down to. Um, in, in, the, uh, in the defendant's brief, it begins with the premise that the court um, found on the settlement agreement. Well, that's, that's not true. Look at the actual language of the order. It begins by saying, quote, the court notes that the question is whether the act of painting the trim on his home violates the declaration. And if so, whether the association's action to declare that there was a breach of the declaration and to bring a lawsuit was reasonable, i.e., was it in bad faith or was it arbitrary, capricious, or just unreasonable under the facts? Now, in Mr. Getz's reply brief, I think they say that this is just preamble language. I'm not sure that I agree with that. This is the court setting the table. This is the court telling you what the court is out to do. We're gonna determine whether or not Mr. Uh, Mr. Getz is in breach of the declaration and whether the association was acting arbitrarily, capriciously, or in bad faith. Now, the court goes on to say that the parties are operating in good faith. And then we get a lot of talk about, about the settlement agreement, which again was part of the briefing because it shows that um, the association was acting reasonably and not acting in a capricious manner. And let me say as a footnote here, we should also bear in mind 
that contemporaneously along with our motion for summary judgment, Mr. Getz brought a motion for summary judgment based upon the settlement agreement. His argument was, well, I breached the settlement agreement, you can't sue me under the declaration. The court, uh, the court rejected that uh, and found uh, on our motion for summary judgment, not Mr. Uh, Mr. Getz's. Then uh, we go on and get to the operative language of the order, which is what Judge Armstrong brought up. The court therefore finds that Mr. Getz is in breach of contract. Whether it is the declaration or the settlement agreement, he is in breach. In other words, he is in breach of the DEC and the settlement agreement. The court will therefore set this matter for writ of inquiry on the issue of attorney's fees. That's very important. Why is it important? Because in order to get to attorney's fees, the judge is going to the declaration, not to a settlement agreement, to the declaration. Then we get to the actual order on the motion for fees after the writ of inquiry hearing. Again, this is very important. The association's entitlement to its reasonable fees and costs comes from that certain villages of Cool Springs declaration of covenants, conditions, and restrictions, what I'm calling the declaration. Here's the important part, the contract between the parties. So what do we have here? We have the court saying that Mr. Getz is in breach of a settlement agreement and the declaration. Then the judge goes on to give his remedies based upon the declaration. So the notion that uh, the judge found solely on the settlement agreement is incorrect. Uh, now, let's talk a little bit about being arbitrary, capricious, and in bad faith. Um, Mr. Getz has argued in his brief that uh, the association was not entitled to a judgment uh, on summary judgment based under the declaration. Uh, they're arguing, well, there was, there was no discussion of reasonable or reasonableness or being arbitrary or capricious. Well, there are a couple of things here. Uh, first of all, the association brought that up in the motion for summary judgment. But here is the more important thing. If you look at Mr. Getz's responses to the motion for summary judgment and his own motion for summary judgment, there's no discussion of reasonableness. All they were doing is beating the drum about the settlement agreement, whereas the association is arguing, yes, we're in breach, Mr. Getz is in breach, he's, he's acknowledged that, but we also have all these facts here about a settlement agreement and, and, um, and an architect and all these things discussing the actual aesthetics of, of the neighborhood, which demonstrates reasonableness. And as Mr. Getz pointed out in his brief, that's a question of fact. What he didn't uh, point out is that Mr. Getz has the burden of proof. Uh, Mr. Getz has brought no proof uh, that the association was acting in any arbitrary, reasonable, uh, unreasonable, or capricious manner. And uh, the trial court specifically found that everybody was acting in good faith. So, clearly, based upon Mr. Getz's own admission that uh, he breached the, uh, breached the declaration and you know, the settlement agreement also, uh, the association would be entitled to summary judgment, which is what the court found. Because again, we have to look at the order in its entirety. And um, uh, Judge Higgins found that Mr. Getz had violated both the settlement agreement, which by the way was before we filed suit, uh, and the declaration, which is why we got where we are today. Now let's talk about the fee provision just for a minute. Um, Mr. Krogh brought up the Parker case. I know the Parker case very well. I wrote the brief uh, that came to this court on the Parker case. Um, but m more importantly, we need to look at what the what the actual language is in the fee provision. Because there was some talk in the briefing about liens and, and things like that. Ultimately, it comes down to this. It says, this, this is the fee provision from uh, the declaration. Any and all costs in enforcing the declaration, including attorney's fees, and by the way, it doesn't say how you're enforcing the declaration. It doesn't say you have to file a lawsuit or anything. It just says enforcing the declaration, which clearly the association was doing because that's what the complaint uh, was filed under. 
shall be charged to the member owning the property in violation. Then it goes on to talk about possibly filing a lien if you so desire, um, which is not particularly important here. So um, we have a fee provision which applies that is broad. Recently, uh, this, course had a, uh, this uh, court had a case called Royalton Woods Homeowners Association versus Soholt. Uh, 2019 Westlaw 366-525. In the Royalton Woods case, which is a really broad case in homeowners association law, uh, there was a very similar fee provision to the one that you find in our declaration. Uh, and the court found that it was, quote, broad enough to cover an action to abate, quote, any violation. So. Um, whether one looks at Parker or one looks at Royalton Woods, clearly the fee provision applies. So we have a broad fee provision and an order finding breach under the declaration. That means attorney's fees for the association. I did want to discuss one, one brief issue. Uh, in the reply brief, um, Mr. Getz argues that there was some issue about Rule 27 and, and the rules of appellate procedure. We are not asking for any more fees under Rule 27. We're asking for more fees, assuming this case gets affirmed, it will go back to Judge Higgins and under a case called Eberbach, which we cite a lot, um, a, a, appellate fees when there is an attorney's fee provision uh, are chargeable to, to a defendant. So that's all we're saying here. If it goes back to the trial court, um, affirmed, we will go and ask the judge again for uh, more attorney's fees for discussing here. Um, there were a couple of other issues in, in the brief. Uh, they talked about whether or not the, uh, the actual injunctive language was too vague. I strongly disagree. Mr. Getz was instructed by the trial court to repaint his home in a color approved by the association. It's awfully clear. Um, the court, the trial court, is not in the job of determining aesthetics. In fact, there's a, um, another case that um, uh, we cite quite a bit called uh, Avalon Sections, where it indicates that um, uh, an, an, an architectural review committee within an HOA has fairly broad discretion in, in how it polices aesthetics in a neighborhood. So it is not up to the court to determine what the color is. Under the declaration, any homeowner has to uh, ask for any architectural changes, which would include the color change. So Mr. Getz has to repaint his home, which he still has not done, in a color approved by the association. That could not be more clear. Uh, the cases raised in the brief are indeed quite indicative of vagueness. It's, you know, don't, uh, uh, don't interfere with parenting plans, that sort of thing. We're not talking about that. So that's pretty much it, unless you all have some questions. I believe we've got an order that sets forth where the court is coming from, that the court found a violation of the declaration, and as the clear order says, is finding for attorney's fees based under the declaration. So unless the court has any more questions, I will simply ask this, this case get affirmed and sent back to the trial court accordingly. Hearing no further questions, thank you, Mr. Baskind. And thank you, Ron. We'll hear from rebuttal from Mr. Krogh. Thank you, Your Honors. I'll start on a small point related to fees. Uh, a bureau bank might entitle a plaintiff in the plaintiff's position to fees on appeal had it preserved it. Mr. Baskin, my friend, is asking this court to disregard or perhaps overrule Killingsworth versus Ted Russell Ford, and the court knows it can't do that. Mr. Baskin did not preserve his claim for fees on appeal. It is waived. Um, another small point on Rule 65. Nobody's asking the court, the trial court, to pick a color. The association can pick whatever colors it likes. But if the association wants an enforceable injunction that complies with Rule 65.021, it needs to tell the court what colors it wants. Because Rule 65.021 says that you can't incorporate a standard by reference into an injunction. It has to be within the four corners of the injunction itself. 
And, and so, so that, it, we're not asking the court, this court or the trial court, to pick any color. We're just saying that if you want us, if you want to order us to do a color, you, you can't tell us to go out and find out later from someone else what the color is. It has to be in the order. And I think that's clear from the case law. I mean, how, how can you say don't refer to the complaint if the complaint specifically lays out what you're talking about? Don't refer to the complaint, uh, but refer to some unknown decision by some third party that's not in the record and that nobody can, nobody knows. And that, as a practical matter, it may not even have been made yet. Right? There's going to be, there was a practical matter will be all sorts of rigmarole in the trial court or back uh, following the remand about you know, whether or not we've, you know, there's been compliance with particular steps for requesting ruling on that if it doesn't get into the court's order. We're entitled under Rule 65 to clarity on that in the order. Mr. Baskin says that the plaintiff only sued on the complaint and didn't, uh, therefore didn't seek and wasn't even, perhaps wasn't entitled to summary judgment on the settlement agreement. And they filed a motion to enforce the settlement agreement in March of 2020. Um, for some reason, that was never set for hearing or ruled on. And we've disposed of that argument on pages 10 and 11 of our reply brief, Your Honors, citing, among other things, the Aaron case that the trial court was authorized to afford the parties the relief to which they were entitled. There was a prayer for general relief in the plaintiff's complaint. There was no, no obstacle, no procedural technical obstacle to the trial court entering a judgment on the settlement agreement. And there's nothing in the trial court's judgment, for instance, that makes any finding that it's invoking Rule 56.03 or making any other sort of finding based on arguments the parties have made or haven't made to um, make inclusion about the absence of disputed material facts about that arbitrary and capriciousness issue. It talks about the declaration in the background, the section on page two, the statement on page two that my friend Mr. Baskin invoked is in a section titled background, right? It's essentially a historical present use of the language. It maybe it would be clear if it were written in the past tense. It's setting up the case. It's not setting up the court. It's not the content of the court's analysis. That's on pages three and four. The court was clear what it did. It enforced the settlement agreement. Fees shifting clause in the declaration does not extend that far. We would ask the court to reverse for that reason, to that extent. All right. Thank you both for your arguments. We'll take this um, matter under advisement. There Thank being you. nothing further on the morning docket, we'll, we'll adjourn. All rise.